I'd like you to turn to John chapter 16, verse 1 this evening. Actually, there's, uh, we're going to look at three different areas in John chapter 16. But the first one we're going to look at tonight is uh, the ver very first verse. And uh, Jesus is speaking these words, and he says, These things I have spoken to you, that you may not be scandalistate, scandalized, made to stumble, to be trapped. I speak these words to you, that you not be made to stumble. Then drop on down to verse 21. And he's giving an illustration here. And uh, we'll look at verses 21 to 24. And he says, The woman, when she gives birth, and I'll stop right there for a moment and just say, you know, this, is, this analogy is given as a sign in the book of Revelation chapter 12. A woman giving birth. The woman, when she gives birth, has grief because her hour is come. But when she brings forth the child, she no longer remembers the flipseos, the tribulation, on account of the joy that a man has been born into the world. And you now, therefore, indeed have grief. And of course, he's speaking to the disciples because he's been telling them he's going to have to leave them. And of course, he, these, uh, this is the evening before he is crucified. And he says, And you now, therefore, indeed have grief. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and no one takes your joy from you. And in that day you shall ask nothing of me. Amen, amen. Truly, truly, I say to you that whatsoever you may ask the Father in my name, he will give you. We just used that verse, talked about that on Sunday. Hitherto you ask nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Now drop on down to verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have flipsin. That's the same word that was used to describe the woman who was in travail. You will, you have tribulation. But be of good courage. I have overcome, and that's the word that we get the word Nike from, victory. I have victory over the world. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, as we meditate on these words tonight, we ask that you would guide us into all the truth, which is the same thing that Jesus promised his disciples, that your spirit would guide them into all the truth. Father, we don't want to be deceived, nor do we want to deceive anyone. We just want to know your truth, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can probably guess by the words that I have em emphasized tonight, uh, and in particular the fact that the word tribulation is used twice, is I'm going to be looking at this word tribulation. What is it? Um, I think that we have a lot of problems these days, and when I say we have a lot of problems, I'm talking about uh, evangelical Christianity, uh, Bible-believing Christianity, because there's some people that are, say they're Christians and don't believe the Bible. Uh, but I think we have a lot of problems over this word 
that is and, and you notice it was translated in other ways other than tribulation, but it means tribulation. Tribulation means narrowness. It means being squeezed into an area where you're uncomfortable. And that's what the word tribulation means. If you look in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, you'll find that the assembly at Smyrna, which was in Asia Minor, is being addressed by Jesus. And the assembly there, it was told that they would have flip sin, they would have tribulation for ten days. Now let me ask you a question. Was the church in Smyrna raptured at the end of the ten days? No, they weren't. You see, for some reason... In the last many decades, perhaps the last 100 or 200 years, that the word tribulation has been very closely associated with the return of Christ. And yet, in these passages that we have here, they are applied to people that are long gone almost 2,000 years ago. Tribulation is not something associated with the rapture. Or the other word for rapture, of course, in the Greek is harpazo, which means to be snatched away. But tribulation is associated with being a saint living among the wicked of the world. And there have been saints for thousands of years living among the wicked of the world. And if you're a saint, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have flipsis. That's exactly what Jesus said uh, in, uh, to that church. He said in Smyrna, he says, you're going to have tribulation. And then, and of course, back in chapter 16, verse 33, he says, in the world you have flips in, you have tribulation, you have pressure, You're, the world is pressuring you, trying to fit you into what they think you should be. Um, I would go so far as to say that there are some people who have a particular view of uh, the coming of the Lord, and they would have you fit into exactly what they say. And believe me, if you're with a bunch of preachers and you have one or two that are like that, it, it is a pressure to be with them uh, because there, you know there's either some things you can't talk about or should they start talking about it, you know that if you say anything contrary that there's going to be some hard feelings, which is sad. Uh, which is why I'm covering this tonight. Um, Jesus promised you and me, we will have tribulation. The question is, why are there so many today promising an escape from tribulation when our own Lord and Savior said, you are going to have tribulation. He didn't qualify what time uh, of the prophetic calendar he was talking about. He just said, if you're a follower of him, you're going to have tribulation. Well, there's something to keep in mind when we're looking at all this, and that is, is that the enemy, Hasatan, does not know when the final events are going to happen. But he's not a dummy. He's, he's read the scripture. In fact, Satan has the scripture memorized. Uh, you say, preacher, how do you know that? Well, because when Jesus went out into the wilderness to be tempted, Satan was quoting passages of scripture to him. Of course, he was, he was twisting them to mean something that they don't mean. And you see, that is the problem. 
when people try to misapply the scripture. And even a saint can misapply and misunderstand the scripture. And you see, that's why I always pray, Lord, don't let me be deceived and don't let me deceive anybody. I, I want to give the truth. I want to give it straight. What we need to ask regarding the timing of the event that's known as the Harpazo is what does the scripture say? Not, not what does some fellow that lived a couple hundred years ago or 500 years ago say about it, but what does the scripture say? What does the apostle Paul say? What does Peter say? What does John say? What does Jesus say? There is no other room to say anything about the timing of these events except for what the scripture says. I, I know that we would all like to think that we will escape bad times. But folks, we're in bad times right now. How do you explain it? How do you explain it? Now there's another thing that we have to remember too. Or maybe it's a question that we have to remember. Why have there been so many mistaken identifications of the man of sin, the Antichrist, down through the ages? And the reason is it all goes back to timing. Timing. I want to point out something to you in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, that the Philadelphian saints, the saints that were in the church, uh, the assembly of Philadelphia, not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but Philadelphia, Asia Minor, and these saints are promised not an escape from tribulation, but rather being spared from the time of Perasmu. Perasmu. What is Perasmu? Turn to Luke chapter 11, verse 4. Just about every denomination has memorized the Lord's Prayer. And this is a portion of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus says to pray like this and he says to say, lead us not into, and the English translation says temptation. But perasmu does not mean temptation. It means trial. Trial. And so when he told the church at Philadelphia, he told them that he, they would be kept from the time that would try the whole world. Trial. Trial. I believe uh, I came across a fellow that wrote something uh, that kind of explains why so many people are mistaken. This man's name is David Tu, T-U-E. And this is what he said. He said, since Satan doesn't know when this time will occur, because remember, Jesus said nobody knows except the Father in heaven, not the angels, uh, not the enemy, no man, just the Father knows when he's going to send the Son for us. Since Satan doesn't know, he has prepared someone as his Antichrist in every generation. Now look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 to 10. And, and this is where this is these passages is where he gets that idea from. And I've heard this this concept before for many years 
that Satan always has somebody in every generation poised to fill that role. Now Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, for the mystery of lawlessness, and that's a key word, lawlessness, because that's what the Antichrist will be, is a lawless one, and the age will be a lawless one. For the mystery of lawlessness is already working. Present progressive, right now. Only there is he who restrains at present until he be gone out of the midst. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will cancel. And that's what that word really means. It means to cancel. Whom the Lord will cancel with the breath of his mouth and leave unemployed. The word annul, it means you have no job anymore. The Antichrist will have no job anymore when the Lord comes back. Uh, he will leave him unemployed by the appearing or the manifestation of his coming, which is the parousia. And then he... Paul goes back and he starts referring back to the Antichrist and he says, who's coming? See, first he talked about Jesus coming. Now he's going back and talking about the Antichrist coming. Who's coming is according to the working of Satan in every power and signs and wonders of falsehood and in every deceit of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. In other words, a person that loves the truth, that is one of the signs that you've been saved. When you want to know the truth, because Jesus said, he's the truth. God is the truth. Anything that disagrees with God is a lie. So Satan has to develop his Antichrist before the restraint is removed. And yet he does not know when this will be. Therefore, he must always have someone ready to take on this role. And John tells us that this is happening. Look in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. John says, Little children, it is the last hour. And according as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. Whence we know that the last hour is it is. And so he's saying, and, and that's the reason why you will hear preachers say, we've been living in the last days for 2,000 years. That's correct. Because of what John just said here. There are many antichrists. There is a lawlessness. And Satan keeps, keeps it going. He keeps the pot stirred. John writes that there were already Antichrist at the time of his letter. He defines an Antichrist, and, and this is important, folks. This is important. Because, you see, you have to understand who your enemy is. The, an Antichrist is someone who denies the Father, Father God, and the Son, God the Son, Jesus, denies that the Son is the Messiah, the Christ, denies that he came from the Father, and denies that he was born in the flesh. He is Satan's right-hand man, doing his work 
in the world acting as the enemy's son. And that's what the Antichrist is. He's the enemy's son. So what does the Antichrist look like? That's interesting. I bet you never heard that one before. What does he look like? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 13 to 15. Paul says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And is it not wonderful? For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is not a great thing if his servants also transform themselves as servants of righteousness, of whom the end shall be according to their works. So, in other words, an evil person, a really evil person, is going to want to make other people think that he is the most pure or she is the most pure saint that ever walked. Because that's what Satan does. He doesn't want people to say, oh, good grief, there comes that evil uh, angel of light. Don't let's run the other direction. No, he, he wants you on his side. All you got to do is look at an election. <laughs> Listen to the candidates. It seems like they all are following the enemy with their falsehoods. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Paul didn't want anyone to be deceived. Uh, no one should want a believer to be deceived. No believer should want to be deceived. Jesus warns and warns and warns against us being deceived. Not anyone should deceive you in no way. I know that's a double negative, but that's perfectly correct in Greek. And it's perfectly correct in Spanish and a number of other languages. Not anyone should deceive you in no way. Because... It will not be, in other words, this, this coming of the lawless one, unless, please note, unless the apostasy shall come first. Folks, I want to emphasize to you that you have to go hundreds of years before the time of Koine Greek to find one single instance of this word apostasia to mean departing a place. And you have to go hundreds of years in the future past the time of the New Testament to even try to find somebody who uses the term as departure, like a train leaving the station. There simply are no historic records, secular or religious, that say the word apostasy means the snatching away of the church or somebody leaving the earth. It, it, it just doesn't happen. And see, that's one of the things that bothers me when I hear, uh, air quotes, Christians um, saying that the word apostasy is another word for the rapture. It's simply not true. And so when you hear something that's simply not true, it kind of makes you kind of wonder, what else am I listening to? Unless the apostasy shall have come first, the falling away from the faith by the so-called Christians of that day and age, which I believe perfectly describes our day and age now. And, there's a second part to this, the man of sin shall have been revealed, 
the son of perdition. And the word perdition here is the word apaleas. And it's very close to the use of the word in the book of Revelation for the destroyer or Apollyon that we have in the book of Revelation. Because it's based on Apollo, the, the, uh, the Greek, so-called Greek god, who was destructive, destroyer. He who opposes, and that now he's describing uh, what the Antichrist, he who opposes, that's first part, and exalts, that's the second part, himself above all called God. In other words, all the religions of the world is not going to matter. He's going to say, well, that's not, that's not me. I'm God. That's, that's what the Antichrist is going to say. Or object of veneration. So as for him to sit down in the temple of God. Now just remember, there was a temple of God at the time that Paul wrote Thessalonians. It was still operational in Israel. Okay? As long as there is a temple there, then people could say, hey, it's, it's about to happen. But when the temple was destroyed... Well, this couldn't happen anymore because the temple of God was destroyed. So as for him to sit down in the temple of God as God, setting forth himself that he is God. Now, I came across something Actually, it was sent to me just a couple of days ago. And uh, I, I want to read this to you. And as, as you hear this, listen to this, ask yourself, does this sound familiar? Now, this is a testimony that was written by a lady named Kitty Worthman. She was an Austrian girl living in Austria in the 1930s. Okay? And here's what she said. I cannot tell you that Hitler took Austria by tanks and guns. It would distort history. If you remember the plot of The Sound of Music, the Von Trapp family escaped over the Alps rather than submit to the Nazis. Kitty wasn't so lucky. Her family chose to stay in her native Austria. She was 10 years old, but bright and aware, and she was watching. And now this is where she begins talking. We elected him by a landslide. 98% of the vote, she recalls. 98% of the Austrians. Remember, Hitler was not German. He was Austrian. And 98% of the Austrians voted for him to come in and take over their country. 98%. She wasn't old enough to vote in 1938, approaching her 11th birthday, but she remembers this. Everyone thinks that Hitler just rolled in with tanks and took Austria by force. Not so. Hitler was welcomed to Austria. In 1938, Austria was in deep depression. Nearly one-third of our workforce was unemployed. Hmm. How many did they say we had unemployed earlier this year? 40 million? Just, just thinking out loud here. Okay. We had 25% inflation and 25% bank loan interest rates. Now, right now, it's, it's zero is a bank loan. Zero percent. Farmers and business people were declaring bankruptcy daily. Young people were going from house to house begging for food. 
Not that they didn't want to work, there simply weren't any jobs. My mother was a Christian woman and believed in helping people in need. Every day we cooked a big kettle of soup and baked bread to feed those poor hungry people about 30 daily. We looked to our neighbor on the north, Germany, where Hitler had been in power since 1933, five years, she recalls. We had been told that they didn't have unemployment or crime and they had a high standard of living. Nothing was ever said about persecution of any group, Jewish or otherwise. We were led to believe that everyone in Germany was happy. We wanted the same way of life in Austria. We were promised that a vote for Hitler would mean the end of unemployment and help for the family. Hitler also said that businesses would be assisted and farmers would get their farms back. 98% of the population voted to annex Austria to Germany and have Hitler for our ruler. We were overjoyed, remembers Kitty. And for three days we danced in the streets and had candlelight parades. The new government opened up big field kitchens and everyone was fed. After the election, German officials were appointed and like a miracle, we suddenly had law and order. Three or four weeks later, everyone was employed. The government made sure that a lot of work was created through the public works service. Hitler decided we should have equal rights for women. Before this, it was a custom that married Austrian women did not work outside the home. An able-bodied husband would be looked down on if he couldn't support his family. Many women in the teaching profession were elated that they could retain the jobs they had previously had, had been required to give up for marriage. Then we lost religious education for kids. Our education was nationalized. I attended a very good public school. The population was predominantly Roman Catholic. So we had religion in our schools. The day we elected Hitler, March 13, 1938, I walked into my classroom to find the crucifix replaced by Hitler's picture hanging next to a Nazi flag. Our teacher, a very devout woman, stood up and told the class we wouldn't pray or have religion anymore. Instead, we sang Deutschland, Deutschland über alles and had physical education. Sunday became National Youth Day with compulsory attendance. Parents were not pleased about the sudden change in curriculum. They were told that if they did not send us, they would receive a stiff letter of warning for the first time. The second time, they would be fined the equivalent of $300, and that's in the 1930s. That's the cost of a car. And the third time, they would be subject to jail, and then things got worse. The first two hours consisted of political indoctrination. Boy, that sounds like schools today, doesn't it? The rest of the day we had sports. At time, as time went along, we loved it. Oh, we had so much fun and got our sports equipment free. We would go home and gleefully tell our parents about the wonderful time we had. My mother was very unhappy, remembers Kitty. <clears throat> When the next term started, she took me out of public school and put me in a con convent. I told her she couldn't do that, and she told me that someday when I grew up, I would be grateful. There was a very good curriculum, but hardly any fun. No sports, no political indoctrination. I hated it at first, but felt I could tolerate it. Every once in a while, on holidays, I went home. I would go back to my old friends and ask what was going on and wh what they were doing. Their loose lifestyle was very alarming to me. They lived without religion. 
By that time, unwed mothers were glorified for having a baby for Hitler. It seems strange to me that our society changed so suddenly. As time went along, I realized what a great deed my mother did so that I wasn't exposed to that kind of humanistic philosophy. How many generations have been raised like that in our schools? In 1939, the war started and a food bank was established. All food was rationed and could only be purchased using food stamps. At that same time, a full employment law was passed, which meant if you didn't work, you didn't get a ration card. And if you didn't have a card, you starved to death. Women who stayed home to raise their families didn't have any marketable skills and often had to take jobs more suited for men. Soon after this, the draft was implemented. Has, has anybody heard about talk about a draft being started back up in this country? Yeah. There's been some talk. It was compulsory for young people, male and female, to give one year to the labor corps, remembers Kitty. During the day, the girls worked on the farms, and at night they returned to their barracks for military training just like the boys. They were trained to be anti-aircraft gunners and participated in the Signal Corps. After the Labor Corps, they were not discharged but were used in the front lines. When I go back to Austria to visit my family and friends, most of these women are emotional cripples. Now, this, now she's talking about going back to Austria today. Because they just were not equipped to handle the horrors of combat. Three months before I turned 18, I was severely injured in an air raid attack. I nearly had a leg amputated. So I was spared having to go into the labor corps and into military service. When the mothers had to go out into the workforce, the government immediately established child care centers. You could take your children ages four weeks old to school age and leave them there around the clock seven days a week under the total care of the government. Remember, the government's the Nazis. The state raised a whole generation of children. There were no motherly women to take care of the children, just people highly trained in child psychology. By this time, no one talked about equal rights. We knew we had been had. Before Hitler, we had a very good medical care. Oh, now this begins to sound interesting, doesn't it? Many American doctors trained at the University of Vienna. After Hitler, health care was socialized, free for everyone. Doctors were salaried by the government. The problem was, since it was free, the people were going to the doctors for everything. When the good doctor arrived at his office at 8 a.m., 40 people were already waiting, and at the same time, the hospitals were full. If you needed elective surgery, you had to wait a year or two for your turn. There was no money for research as it was poured into socialized medicine. Research at the medical schools literally stopped. So the best doctors left Austria and immigrated to other countries. As for health care, our tax rates went up to 80% of our income. Newlyweds immediately received a $1,000 loan from the government to establish a household. We had big programs for families. All day care and education were free. High schools were taken over by the government and college tuition was subsidized. Everyone was entitled to free handouts such as food stamps, clothing, and housing. We had another agency designed to monitor business. My brother-in-law owned a restaurant that had square tables. Government officials told him he had to replace them with round tables because people might bump themselves on the corners. Then they said he had to have additional bathroom facilities. It was just a small dairy business with a snack bar. 
He couldn't meet all the demands. Soon he went out of business. If the government owned the large businesses and not many small ones existed, it could be in control. I think you need to think about that. The small businesses were all put out. And the big businesses ran everything because the government could now run them. Does that sound familiar? We had consumer protection too. We were told how to shop and what to buy. Free enterprise was essentially abolished. We had a planning agency specially designed for farmers. The agents would go to the farms, count the livestock, and then tell the farmers what to produce and how to produce it. In 1944, I was a student teacher in a small village in the Alps. The villagers were surrounded by mountain passes, which in the winter were closed off with snow, causing people to be isolated. So people intermarried and offspring were sometimes retarded. When I arrived, I was told there were 15 mentally retarded adults, but they were all useful and did good manual work. I knew one named Vincent very well. He was a janitor at, of the school. One day I looked out the window and saw Vincent and others getting into a van. I asked my superior where they were going. She said to an institution where the state health department would teach them a trade and to read and write. The families were required to sign papers with a little clause. Now listen to this, New York. With a little clause that they could not visit for six months. They were told visits would interfere with the program and might cause homesickness. As time passed, letters started to dribble back saying these people died a natural and merciful death. The villagers were not fooled. We suspected what was happening. Those people left in excellent physical health and all died within six months. We called this euthanasia. Next came gun registration. People were getting injured by guns. Hitler said that the real way to catch criminals, we still had a few, was by matching serial numbers on guns. Most citizens were law-abiding and dutifully marched to the police station to register their firearms. Not long afterwards, the police said that it was best for everyone to turn in their guns. The authorities already knew who had them, so it was futile not to comply voluntarily. No more freedom of speech. Anyone who said something against the government was taken away. We knew many people who were arrested, not only Jews, but priests and ministers who spoke up. Totalitarianism didn't come quickly. It took five years, from 1938 to 1943, to realize full dictatorship in Austria. Had it happened overnight, my countrymen would have fought to the last breath. Instead, we had creeping gradualism. Not, not, uh, we had creeping gradualism. Now, our only weapons were broom handles. The whole idea sounds almost unbelievable that the state, little by little, eroded our freedom. This is my eyewitness account. It is true. Those of us who sailed past the Statue of Liberty came to a country of unbelievable freedom and opportunity. America is truly the greatest country in the world. Don't let freedom slip away. After America, there is no place to go. By the way, do you know how the Nazis used, uh, what they used to track all this information? Little company down in uh, Ohio called International Business Machine had invented the first generation of computers. They were card punch machines. That's how the Nazis tracked the Jews with the help of Big Blue. So folks, every generation is already 
figured out who could be the Antichrist. hundred years ago, it was Hitler. Who is it today? And maybe, is it really the Antichrist? How do you avoid being deceived? That's the question tonight I'm going to leave you with. Well, you hold fast to the Word of God. Not what some preacher says is the Word of God, but what the Word of God says. And you wait for Christ to meet us in the air. Jesus said this in Luke 17, 23 and 24. And they will say to you, Lo, here, or lo, there, go not forth, nor follow. For as the lightning which lightens from the one end under heaven to the other end of heaven shines, thus will be also the Son of Man in, be in his day. Let's pray. Father, we ask again that you would keep us from being deceived. Deceived by anyone about anything. For Father, we serve you and you are true all through and through. And your Son is the truth. And your Word is truth. And we ask that you would make us love your truth. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.